is purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of his word. Pray through the sanctuary, part three. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Oh, loving Father in heaven, we just ask now that you just open our hearts and minds uh, to this Old Testament sanctuary, what it means, how it impacts our lives. Have your Holy Spirit here. Use me, Lord, as a conduit of your love and truth to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have already studied that, God gave Moses a pattern of a sanctuary, a temple in heaven, and said, you make it after the likeness of what I have shown you. And this is a replica of it here. You would go through the gate, and sometimes people would come with their first fruits, vows, gifts, very, very festive time, the feast days they would come. And sometimes somebody would do something not quite right, and they would bring a lamb and they'd go inside and the priest would meet them and they would put their hands on the lamb confess their sin cut the lamb's throat the priest would take the blood sprinkle the blood and that was a symbol that a substitute would come to die for us and who is that substitute yeah john the baptist behold the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world so jesus is a lamb and all through the book of revelation uh, we see the lamb, and then there's an altar with smoke coming up here, and the priest would keep part of the meat, and part of it they would uh, burn, and that symbolized that Jesus would die for our sins as an offering. He died in our place. But then after that, you would come to a, a labor. What's it filled with? Water. What was it made out of? Here's a quiz. Brass. But where did they get the brass? Did, they, did Moses have them go out there and mine? In the, the woman gave their brass or bronze mirrors, and they made the, uh, the labor right there. And I personally think we come to the bronze altar and take Jesus as our Savior, confess those sins, and then we come to the labor, and we go down to wash and we look and God is saying you need to take a deeper look you had those problems here but I have a deeper work to do in your heart at that labor there's a washing that takes place at the end labor the priest would wash there's a something going on so Revelation 1 5 says that Jesus washed us from our sins in his own blood there's a washing, a cleansing that takes place. It also says, I believe, that that labor represents a baptism. There's a death that happens at that bronze altar. Then we come to the labor, we wash, we get a sense of a burial, and we come back to a newness of life. A newness of life. So there's a washing that happens, a baptism that happens. Peter on the day of Pentecost when the people said, what shall we do? After he told them, you killed the Holy One. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you shall receive something. What were they to get? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So I believe the Holy Spirit is with us all along the path of our journey, even before when we're right resisting and should I become a Christian or not, the Holy Spirit's nudging us, urging us, talking to us, pleading with us. And it's working on us. The Holy Spirit's working on us. And then finally we surrender, and when we take Jesus as our Savior, and the cleansing starts happening, then the Holy Spirit fills us. But he needs to work on us to open our hearts so he can what? Fill us. And that is a tremendous gift. Jesus is a tremendous gift. The Holy Spirit is a tremendous gift. And we walk in a newness of life. We become new creatures, born again, a fresh start. Isn't that wonderful? Who's happy for the fresh start that God gave them? Yeah, absolutely. All your sins are forgiven. You are adopted into God's family. 
accepted to join in with Christ, to stand before God clean and pure as if you have never sinned. Christ's robe of righteousness covers you as you've given him your heart. And you stand there as a child of God in the newness of life. And there's also a cleansing happens from how much sin? All sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's in verse 9, but verse 7 says that he also cleanses us from all sin. So if I'm cleansed from all sin and all righteousness, what am I standing before God as? Righteous and holy. Yeah. As if we never sinned. That's an amazing thing that happens at that, at that uh, bronze altar. We take a look at ourselves. We realize, Lord, I just began the process. There's a lot more. And like I said, the door to that sanctuary, that is the narrow gate, the straight gate. But once you get through that sanctuary, and you go to all these articles that are in there, because there was a bronze altar, the bronze uh, labor, then there's a table of showbread, candlesticks, altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant. That's the narrow way. God is showing you the narrow way that every one of those articles has a ministry to you to convert you, to keep you, to empower you. And actually, I have found at times, as I'm going through the sanctuary in my life, I may be at the table of showbread and the Lord reveals to me, you know what, you said something you shouldn't have said. I'm back at the bronze altar. Lord, forgive me what I've done. Just wash that from me and save me, and I'm going on again. So we go, and the whole, all of them are working for you at the same time, I believe. Every one of them. The candlesticks are working for you. The altar of incense is working for you. The labor as God is cleansing you deeper and deeper into your life. This is what God says in Isaiah to the nation of Israel. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your, skins are, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. White as snow. I love that song, that praise song. Why this new? I just I can listen to that over and over. Our skins, are, our sins are scarlet colored. They're stained. When you come to Jesus, what He wants to do? He wants to wash you and make you white as snow. All the guilt, the grief. There's no more condemnation anymore. God's looking at you as a loving child. He pours all His resources on you. Uh, he puts His name on your forehead. Gives you the Holy Spirit. The care of the angels. Gives you a new heart. It's amazing what God does, what God does. And we see this, come and let us reason together. God is saying, let's sit down and talk about it. We see him coming to Adam and Eve after they sinned. We see him coming to Cain when Cain refused to give the wrong uh, sacrifice. God was speaking, coming, reasoning, talking to them, trying to work it out. Uh, we see he came to, uh, to Abraham and gave him the covenant. Nicodemus, that was a time of coming and reasoning together. And I guess if we were American natives, we'd call it a powwow. A powwow. What's a powwow? You sit down and you talk things out, right? A powwow. And they would put out a peace, a peace pipe at a powwow. Now, I don't know if that's true, maybe watching too many westerns as a kid, but I think when Jesus sits down with us, he does not pull out a peace pipe, he pulls out a peace treaty. It's called the covenant of peace, that he and the Father worked together even before the world was, even before, the, even before time began in the, new, in the uh, newer translations. It's, just, it's the same Greek words. Even before time began, God had a plan to save any creature that would wander away. So God actually pulls out a peace treaty, lays it out and says, here's a peace treaty, and here's the conditions of the covenant. Just confess, repent, Turn and you're back in favor with me. So it's a, that's what happens. So come and let us reason together. God is reasonable. That's what he's saying. I am reasonable. I am agreeable. I can be talked with. I'm not a tyrant. It's not my way or the highway. I'm willing to sit down and talk with you and talk this out. I'm willing to communicate with you and work out something so that you can have salvation. So don't run away from God. You need to be running to him. Amen. Right? That's the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. You can have a place to run to, and that's a symbol of Christ running. Here's David after Bathsheba. 
David was king, army out in a great battle. And what's he doing? He's back at the palace, just having a vacation. One afternoon, he's sleeping. And he gets up, decides to just stroll along the top. And he strolls, and he went from king to peeping Tom. Huh? Huh? Right? Real men don't look twice. Well, David was in serious spiritual trouble, and he looked twice at a woman, Ellen White says, who had, she just had a beauty that was just fatal, a fatal beauty, she calls Bathsheba, had a fatal beauty. And she was taking a bath in the dark at night because they had no plumbing outside where it was quiet, and no one could see her except David from his vantage point. So she was a modest woman, a very modest woman. So well, what did he do? He took her. He took her. And this is what it says here. David sent messengers and what's it say? Took her. There's a movie, Taken. You see it advertised, Taken, I guess. Someone stolen or whatever. He actually, he took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. When Nathan confronted David over what he did, remember the rich man had how many sheep? 100 sheep. There was a poor guy who only had one little sheep. Love that little sheep. That was his like, littlest, greatest little thing. That was the relationship of Uriah and Bathsheba. Bathsheba is not one of the bad girls of the Bible. So if you get a book, Bad Girls of the Bible, Bathsheba belongs in the good girls of the Bible. Her and Uriah were tight. Tight. But the rich man had a friend came, so what did he do? Does it say the sheep wandered away? No. He what? Took it. He took her. He took her. And Ellen White says that what happened with um, Ammon and Tamar was a repeat of David and Bathsheba. Basically, he raped her. That's what he did. Now, here's the thing. As we came back here, David prayed, purge me with hyssop and I shall be what? Clean. This is after he did what he did to Uriah and Bathsheba, an act of treachery. So he's saying, purge me, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be what? Whiter than snow. Now that's David's side of getting clean from what he did. But if you go back to this story here, he lay with her. So he took her, and what does she do after David laid with her? Did she say, like the harlot in the book of ah, I've done nothing wrong or whatever? What's she doing? She purified herself from her uncleanness. Her uncleanness is what David did to her. So she, what does she do? She just, she came to God and said, Lord, I've been defiled by this man. He took me, he was a king, forced me, and what did she do? She just went to God and said, Lord, just purify me. Just help me in the situation. I have never been in that situation. I can't even imagine. But I'm just saying, victims have purification. Victims have a cleansing. If there's a sin, it's usually against someone else. If you've been a victim, God can cleanse you from that. That, all, that bronze altar is for everyone, either who has had a sin upon them that they couldn't you know, get away from, or whether they've sinned. So Bathsheba purified herself. And that, that just speaks volumes to me of the restoration of God in the sanctuary service. That, that whole system of purification. So that's really good news in my, in my estimation. Because there's a lot of ways people are violated. There's physical violence, sexual violence, there's emotional abuse, a neglect. All kinds of things happen to us. And you know what we can do? We can let it go. Okay, now I'm not a psychologist. I'm going to be careful here. This is a very touchy subject, very sensitive subject. But I'm just saying God can help anybody that anything has happened to you. God can help. God is there even for those who bad things have happened to us. God can hold us up. And what's the interesting about Bathsheba, what throws everybody off? She became the number one queen. 
She became the number one queen. God healed her to the point where she could actually, she basically took over the harem. She was David's favorite wife. So the Lord had really, really uh, healed her in a mighty, marvelous way. Then David in that psalm says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So if our heart is sin polluted, what can God do? Clean it. He has a way of washing our hearts. The sin, the selfishness, the pride, the greed, the lust, the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the revenge. God has a way of just, just washing that out, washing it out. And what do we become? Kind, peaceful, stable. So at that, at that, at the uh, labor, God has a tremendous work for the human race because sin is defiling on levels so deep. I don't think we realize how how much sin has a grip on us. But we need to realize that God has the power to release all that, wash it away, forgive it, cleanse it, give you victory over it. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus has the ability to actually take that away from you. To take that away from you. Ezekiel 36, 25, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be what? Clean! I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So God has a way to help us to stand before him pure. And you are actually pure. Are you going to struggle with temptation? Yes. That's part of living. But what does temptation now do for you? God has promised a way of escape. He is able to keep you from falling. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. He's able to make us more than conquerors through him who loved us. The verse is a multitude. I think what God can do for us when we come for that cleansing that only he can give. We can't make ourselves clean. We can't. It has to be a gift from God. God will give that to you as a gift simply by faith asking you for it. Lord, I've been a sinner. I've done so many wrong things. Lord, I just have a pile high. I've been selfish, prideful, Lord. I've done things I shouldn't have done. Please forgive me, dear Lord. I'm so sorry for what I've done. I want a new life. Put me in your hands. You be the potter. I'm the clay now. I'm giving my life over to you to walk in your ways. Help me, encourage me, strengthen me, dear Lord. Thank you so much for the gift of salvation. And then what comes with that clean heart says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will take the heart of stone out of you and give you a heart of flesh or no more hard-heartedness. So when the cleansing comes, so does it come a whole new personality. The new spirit now, gentleness, generosity, kindness, patience, peace. God is going to give you a whole new personality, a whole new Christ-like personality. So the areas where you are weak in, God's going to make you stronger in those. Does that sound like good news? So not only does it give you a new heart, it gives you a whole new way of relating to life. Okay? It's no more fear. No more anxiety. No more hiding, running away. Or some people, they don't hide to run away, they just get mean. And they learn if they get mean, they can cow people and nobody will bother them. So there's a lot of, a lot of coping mechanisms we have that are not productive. And no more power trips or no more shutting down. God says, I will give you a new spirit about you. You will operate on a whole new level you didn't even know existed. I will so build your personality and strengthen you and make you new. You will be fully functioning, a whole mature godly person with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I will build you from the inside out and make you unconquerable. Matter of fact, I'm going to hold you up and stabilize you, establish you in so many ways. So when you get a new heart and a new spirit, it comes with so many blessings. That's why we need to be reading the Bible and see all God has for us. It's just that amazing what's in there. Over 8,000 Bible promises. I've had my Bible here several times. It showed you, okay? 8,000 
Bible promises that God has. They're in there all over for the restoration of the human race. Promises that God will do things for us that we can't do for ourselves. That's what salvation is about. I need to be saved because I can't save myself. I need Jesus to do for me what he did on this earth, live a victorious life and please his Father. He can get it through faith. Who can enter God's house? He who has clean hands and what kind of heart? A pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. So I've had idols in my heart. I have sworn deceitfully before I was converted. But what do I have now? It's called a pure heart. God is going to purify your heart. And those are the ones that will enter in. God says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your what? Hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's all imagery of the labor of drawing near to God. But that's the key, drawing near. Not running away or hiding from God. It's, it's being drawn to him. It's approaching him. And the only reason we're approaching him is because he found us first. And we're just answering his call. Hey, I found you. Then we come. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus calls unto us, come all ye labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We hear his voice, and we're just responding to his great love for us. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. That's us. So what does he do? When we draw near, there's a cleansing of our hands. Our works are now different. Our, our hearts are now different. And no more double-minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in what? All his ways. So now we're single-minded for God. Not one foot in the world, one foot in God's kingdom, both feet firmly planted in God's kingdom. It says here about Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself his own special people. When was the last time someone told you you were special? Matter of fact, this verse tells you God thinks you're pretty special. God thinks you are valuable. He loves you. He wants you in his kingdom. God hungers for your soul more than you do. God is more worried about you than you are worried about yourself. Why do you think God never sleeps or slumbers? Because he always has to watch us every minute. You become a child of the Most High God. A member of the heavenly kingdom. With a right to the tree of life and to live on the earth made new for all eternity. So God is looking to purify for himself a special people. And that's what the sanctuary does as we go through there. It's a pattern of how God purifies us step by step. Cleans us up so that we can live with him forever. And every one of those is a work of his grace that he does for us. Amen? That's what he's doing for us. We just submit to God. And what, he, what does he do? He saves us. Daniel chapter... 12, verse 10, for the people of the book of Daniel. Many shall be purified. What's the time frame for this here in Daniel? What's the, the time frame is when Michael stands up. That's the time frame when Michael stands up. So at the end of time, the devil says, you're never going to make it. You're never going to be good enough. You know what this says here? This is here, in the time of the end, when probation closes, it doesn't say few. Okay, we all know about the cleansing of the sanctuary and the cleansing of God's people. Here is the promise. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. Why can't each one of us be part of the many? What is keeping us from being part of the many? That's a pretty big group. Right? Revelation chapter 7 talks about a multitude, no man can number, who came out of the great tribulation. That's only one, the great tribulation. And Daniel tells us that's at the end of time. So why can't we be purified, tried, and made white? What's holding us back? I'd say there's nothing worth we're doing holding us back 
than to have eternal life. And God's giving us this gift. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise, but the wise will understand. So we are the wise ones who understand God has a plan to clean us up. That's the whole heavenly sanctuary, the day of atonement. All of that is God has a plan. And those who are wise will enter into that plan. Amen? That's what God is looking for. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration. So we need to be washed by God's spirit in our mind, our heart, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our goals, our hopes, our dreams, even things that happened in the past, there's a washing of rebirth. That's the regeneration is, there's a washing at the rebirth where God just takes that and he just washes it away and leaves you clean. And it says here, not by works of righteousness which we have done. That means we can't do it. It's a gift. God washes you, cleans you, purges you as a gift. Would you like that gift? Matter of fact, I think Paul says, I die daily. That's what he was talking about. Every day, God is what he's doing. God's cleaning him every day. And we can have that. So it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration. And that labor, I believe, is telling us there's a washing that God wants to do for us. And only by the wash of regeneration, there's also a renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a what? Mirror. That would give us that imagery of the mirror, of the labor. The mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from what? Glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the laborers telling us, God now is starting a regeneration, a rebirth, a renewal for each one of us. And what did Jesus say? Unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So that labor tells us, we need to go through that labor. Let God wash you, give you a rebirth, make you new, adopt you into his kingdom, you stand before him justified as if you never sinned, a new complete person in him, and then you begin your journey. Then you begin your journey. So uh, if there's something today in your life that needs to be washed, you can ask him. Tonight, kneel down by your bed, give it all to him. Every bit of it, the whole thing, everything you can remember, give it to him. Even a kid when you stole something from your dad or punched your brother or whatever it was, lay it all on the line. Honest to God prayer. Give it all to him and say, Lord, forgive me for it. I'm so sorry for what I've done and I want a new life. Dear Lord, pour your spirit upon me with all its power and help me to be a Christian for you. Loyal, faithful, devoted, with a new start, with a